Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Epilepsy. You've certainly, we've all heard the term. It is a, it's a disorder of the central nervous system where nerve cell activity in the brain becomes, well, disrupted, I guess is the best way to put it. And that can cause lots of problems. Seizures for one, periods of unusual behavior or strange sensations, and sometimes even loss of consciousness. According to the Epilepsy Foundation, there are 3 million people in the United States who have epilepsy. And interestingly, 1 in 26 people in the U.S. will develop epilepsy in their lifetime. That's 4 out of 100, approximately. Wow. Pretty staggering figure. The good news is that most people with epilepsy can become seizure-free by using medication or, in some cases, surgery. Joining us by phone to discuss epilepsy is Dr. Bill Tatum. Dr. Tatum is a neurologist at the Florida campus of Mayo Clinic. Welcome to the program, Dr. Tatum. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, Dr. Tatum, everything good in Jacksonville? Oh, everything's wonderful. Yeah, warm down there? Oh, it's nice and sunny. <laughs> so uh, I, I tried at the top to uh, explain a little bit about what epilepsy is, mm -hmm. but I'd rather hear it from you in lay terms. When somebody asks you, what is epilepsy? How do you explain? Well, you know, I think you really capped it nicely in terms of outlining some of the demographics of what people expect from the term epilepsy. What I usually tell my patients is that the word epilepsy often invokes a sense of uncomfort or discomfort, if you will. But basically what it is is, as you mentioned, it's a disorder of the brain, and it's the brain's inherent capacity to excessively discharge a group of brain cells. Now, that group of brain cells can be centered in different areas that can lead to corresponding symptoms. As you mentioned, very often this will lead to an episode where somebody has a loss of consciousness. There are many different manifestations. You can see symptoms that range anywhere from staring and being unresponsive, almost as if somebody's having a daydreaming spell, but it can also range to something more serious that people refer to as a grand mal seizure, where they can fall to the ground and actually hurt themselves from jerking uh, parts of the body. Frequently, uh, as you mentioned, it's, it's good news because medication will control these seizures in about two-thirds of cases. When they're not controlled by medication, that's when Mayo Clinic usually becomes very proactive in terms of trying to define a treatment that can help individuals, often very young. So 25% uh, of the patients that you see you can't control with medications? About a third. About a third. Yeah, so that's quite a few. And, and heretofore, you haven't had uh, very good options if the medication didn't work, but now you do? Well, you know, over the years, we've recently had a great release of newer medications. So it, it's brought a lot of hope, but still there's a group of people that just don't seem to respond to medication. And what, what are you doing for those people? And in that particular instance, by the time somebody's failed two good trials of two appropriate medicines, that's when we start to think about other non-medical therapies, including surgery. And tell us about that. Uh, how do you uh, identify those patients? You said they failed twice on, on the best drugs that you have yes, available, yes, yes. yet are still having seizures. The, see, the type of seizure depended on the part of the brain that's, that's involved. Exactly. So you've got a patient that, that has failed drug treatment. How do you proceed? So, you know, the first thing is, number one, to make sure that they have epilepsy. There's a fair number of people that actually have spells that may be misidentified not on purpose, but frequently there's other types of episodes that can look just like uh, epilepsy-associated seizures but are not. So diagnosis is number one. Number two, we have to make sure frequently that they've been evaluated for an underlying cause. Seizures are only a symptom of an underlying brain problem. In some cases, we can't find anything, and things that we do, like the MRI scan of the brain, may come back as perfectly normal. But when somebody's failed two good drugs, they have epilepsy, it may appear in a certain part of the brain that we're able to define well, that's when we talk to them about epilepsy surgery. However, I'd be remiss to say 
That's the only treatment because there are other treatments as well. We will often use um, uh, other approaches uh, depending on the type of uh, um, epilepsy someone has, including a dietary control, hmm. a low blood sugar uh oriented type of diet, or we may use electricity in the form of an electrical device. So there's other causes besides epilepsy, but in essence, when somebody's failed two good drugs, their best chance of becoming seizure-free is through epilepsy surgery. Now, we've, uh, we've heard that you are starting or that you are utilizing something called brain mapping at the Florida campus. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, so it's a very exciting innovation. We've been in the operating room much more in individuals that typically have a known cause. Um, sometimes with brain tumor, uh, we're able to pinpoint where seizures arise not only on their MRI, uh, but also doing prolonged EEG monitoring. When they are identified in an area that might be near an area that could be dangerous if it, if it was removed, since we, we don't want to induce any complications that might be just as bad as the seizures themselves, we're doing intraoperative brain mapping. And that brain mapping includes both recording from the brain directly at surgery, but also by providing a small electrical stimulus, we're able to identify areas that are not safe to remove. And in that way, we can provide the surgeon with information that they can, that they can actually use to approach uh, their surgery and also to extend their surgery to a safe boundary. Okay, so if you've got a brain tumor that, that's pressing and causing pressure in the brain, yeah. that could potentially cause a seizure. You take the tumor out. But are you also talking about patients who don't have a tumor, yet that they're going to have some kind of surgery? And what kind of surgery is that? Yes, we do. And it's easy to understand, I think, when you look at an MRI and see a brain tumor, it's not hard to extrapolate that the two are related, seizures and the tumor. Mm -hmm. But we very frequently do use techniques in patients with normal MRIs that do not have a brain tumor. Now, very frequently, that group of patients is often centered in a part of the brain called the temporal lobe. And so we have a great deal of experience in the temporal lobe and in temporal lobe epilepsy. And we have a, a protocol that's set up through Mayo Clinic, and all of our enterprise is set up very similarly to offer a combined approach of different testing to identify the site of onset. And when we're sure that we know the site of onset, uh, that's when we start to uh, uh, proceed towards surgery for okay, individuals okay, but that are then, drug resistant. Okay, but when you do the surgery, are you removing the part of the brain that, uh, that where the seizures originate, or what does the surgery involve? Well, that's a very good question because up until recently I'd have said yes. We take out the seizure focus, so the seizures go away. However, there's a newer form of therapy that uh, has been uh, just very recently um, utilized, not only at our campus in Florida, but at the other sites as well, called laser ablation. We're using laser surgery to not remove, but actually use uh, heat to thermally eliminate the seizure focus uh, by a minimally invasive procedure. So now there's a couple of different surgeries that we're talking about, both the removal as well as the ablation using heat. Wow, it's pretty incredible what you're able to do. So basically you're telling us that for patients who fail drug therapy and have epilepsy, you have some surgical options where you can actually ablate or remove the site in the brain where the seizures are coming from. That's exactly right. And, you know, I always tell my patients, now is a good time to have epilepsy because we have new drugs, we have new surgical techniques, we have new devices that can be used to help them fight their seizures. Quite often people will, will say that there was a child had epilepsy but then outgrew it. Yes. What's, what's yes. happening when that occurs? So it's a very good question, and it's something that we see less frequently in the adult population than we do in children. But what it refers to is oftentimes a genetically-based epilepsy that is predefined 
to both appear and disappear at a certain age. Hmm. And so not that they outgrew it per se, but just that there has been a genetically pre-programmed onset and offset for that specific type of epilepsy. I would say also that for those that have seizures that begin in one part of the brain in adulthood, that's unlikely to occur. All right, neurologist Dr. William Tatum from Mayo Clinic, Florida, Jacksonville. Thanks for being with us, Dr. Tatum. Thanks again. Have a good day.